We're continuing with this lecture with chapter 11. And in lecture 4, which is the final lecture of chapter 11, we're going to use the ISLM curve to derive the demand curve, or the aggregate demand curve. So if we take a look at this overall big picture, well, we've come a long ways. Where um, we've gone through the Keynesian cross and the IS curve, from the liquidity preference theory to derive the LM curve, we bring those together into the ISLM model, which gives us a, a um, model of determination of income and interest rates within the short run. And then we use that to feed into the aggregate demand curve, and we derive the aggregate demand curve. And that's what our purpose is in this chapter. In the next chapter, in chapter 12, we'll go ahead and derive an aggregate supply curve that's a little more complicated in the short run than just the plain everything is abs all prices are absolutely sticky will allow some prices to be well stickier than others uh, but for right now what we're going to do is we're going to go from the LM curve to derive the aggregate demand curve and of course this is the part of the picture that we are dealing with in this chapter so ISLM and aggregate demand so far we've been using the ISLM model just to analyze the short run uh, when price level is assumed to be fixed. However, P could change, which could shift the LM curve, therefore affecting Y. So uh, this, this variable P might not be constant. And when it's not constant, then, well, it causes difficulties when we try to do things like increase monetary policy. Because just imagine, let's say I increase M. All right? Now, what would you expect to happen if I just started increasing the money stock? Well, from principles of macro, you might expect price to go up. So, if money, the supply of, mon of um, money balances or real balances is M over P, and as the Fed, I raise M, but that causes P to go up too, well, what happens to M over P? Does it go up? Does it go down? Does it, you know, stay the same? I don't know, right? And that's part of the part of the struggle here. Then that's one of the things that makes doing macroeconomic policy difficult. Is well, lots of variables changes, and sometimes we have these unintended consequences. So what we want to do now is allow this little more flexibility in our model. So. In the aggregate demand curve, well, we can capture this relationship between price level and income, and that's what the aggregate demand curve does, and that's what we want to do here. Only we want to do it in a little more sophisticated way than we did in Chapter 9. In Chapter 9, we just went straight from the quantity theory, so we just took the equation of exchange, solved that for y, and we got a relationship between y and price level. And while that's a tautology, and it's a little bit simplistic uh, way of getting there. So a much more um, detailed and more rich model of aggregate demand is this one that comes out of the ISLM model. So we're going to do just like we do with every derivation that we've done so far, line up our axes. So the ISLM model, which is this one, right? The top one's ISLM, all right? And the bottom one's going to be aggregate demand. But notice that... In both cases, right, y is on the horizontal axis. So what do we do? We're going to line those two up. Okay. And then, well, let's pick an income. Let's pick, and we end up with a short run equilibrium at one income. And okay, we have one interest rate. That's great. That occurs at price level one. So what should we do now? We've got one point. Well, let's let the price level go up just exogenously so we're going to think of a you know a exogenous price shock or cost shock of some kind so just price level goes up for no good reason right that's our der derivation what's going to happen well money supply the supply of real balances or you could think of the supply of liquidity goes down why because the money stock stays the same we haven't changed that but price level goes up so m over p must go down now what is that going to do to the ISLM model? Well, it's going to be very similar to what would happen if we had a um, contractionary monetary policy, right? LM shifts to the left. 
Right, so at a higher price level, we have the LM curve shifting to the left, and we see what? A higher interest rate, assuming nothing changes. All right, so no accommodation on the part of the central bank for this change in price. No, uh, we just see automatically those interest rates are going to push up, and investment's going to fall, which means what? Income is going to go down, and we have a new point. So now we have two points on our aggregate demand curve. If we assume it's linear, we can just connect the dots, and that gives us our aggregate demand curve. And we can see what causes this aggregate demand curve to be downward sloping. Well, what's causing the aggregate demand curve to be downward sloping is that there is essentially a positive relationship between price level and interest rates, at least according to this model. Uh, which is fairly reasonable. If I think price level is going up and up and up and up, I'm going to demand a little more interest rate right, for, for various reasons. And I might even demand a slightly higher real interest rate because I'm a little more worried about the riskiness of, of this asset, you know, inflation rate risk. I'm a little worried that inflation will be something other than I expect. And, and so um, those two move together, and, well, what happens to investment as the real interest rate goes up, it goes down. And and really, if we wanted a little richer model and a little cooler consumption function that had um, consumer borrowing in it, we'd say consumption probably goes down as the real interest rate goes up. And so since both of those things go down as the interest rate goes up, what's going to happen? Total output, all right? Total GDP is going to go down as interest rates go up. And so we have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. Okay, so, well... How does monetary policy affect the aggregate demand curve? Well, remember, monetary policy shifts the LM curve. So the Fed can um, increase aggregate demand by doing what? By increasing the money stock. If they increase the money stock, they shift the LM curve to the right, right to the right or down, whichever you want to think. And then what happens? Interest rates go down. Investment goes up. And Y goes up. But... It's at the same price level. So we're down here at this new income level, but at the same price level, what's the only way that happened? Is if we have a shift in the aggregate demand curve, right? So we'll see that shift. Okay, what about fiscal policy? Well, simple. Which curve does fiscal policy shift? Does fiscal policy shift the LM curve? No, it doesn't. It shifts the IS curve, doesn't it? All right, so let's say we have an expansionary fiscal policy. So that's an increase in government spending or decrease in taxes. What's going to happen? Well, consumption goes up, which shifts the IS curve to the right. All right, so, and same thing. So we have rightward shift. Okay, same price level, but higher equilibrium income in the short run. What's the only way that happens? is if we have a shift in the aggregate demand curve. right? And which way does it shift it? It shifts it to the right. So that yields an increase in aggregate demand. Okay, exactly what we'd expect. So it's, it's nice that this model gives us, um, well, interpretation or intuition behind you know, kind of the basic story that we told back in um, Principles of Macroeconomics. Now you have a little more theory to back up that story that you learned back in the principles um, when we just had this aggregate demand, aggregate supply um, framework. So now we want to, can we have some kind of talking between the short run, which is what we're dealing with with aggregate demand, and the long run? Well, basically the forces that move uh, our economy, at least in this model, from short run to long run is, well, the gradual adjustment in price level. So we see that prices are essentially, we're basically going off of the sticky price model. We're going to present another model in Chapter 12 that's a little different. But basically, we're, we're thinking that some prices, at least some prices in the economy are sticky. And as those prices come unstuck, as we get longer and longer room and those, those prices can change, what happens? We then move into this more long-run equilibrium. And so let's just recall this, um, we'll recall this table. What happens if 
output is greater than our potential output. Remember, y bar, we're thinking of that as the natural rate of output or the potential output or our potential GDP. Well, then prices rise. If we're in a recession, all right, output is below the potential level of GDP or the natural rate of GDP, prices have to fall. And if it's equal, they remain constant. So basically what we have going on here is we say, well, when they're equal, we're in long-run equilibrium. And when they're not, we're outside of long-run equilibrium. And something is going to happen with price level in order to bring us back to long-run equilibrium. OK, so let's take a look at long run and um, short run effects of an IS shock. So an IS shock, remember, is anything that's going to shift that IS curve. So it could be anything from government policy to um, people just decide they want to consume more or they just want to consume less. Right? Um, so we have an IS curve. And we have our aggregate demand curve. What's going to happen if? Okay, we have our short run aggregate supply curve, right? So remember, sticky prices. Here we have fully sticky prices. All prices are sticky. Aggregate demand, short run aggregate supply. It makes our nice little, you know, asterisk or S or whatever, or X, you know, X or asterisk model, whatever you want to call it. So let's have a negative IS shock. So we shift the IS to the left, which is going to cause aggregate demand to fall, something like this. So in the short run, what happens? In the short run, the, the effects of the IS shock are what? To decrease output. They don't change price level. Why don't they change price level? Because price level's stuck. So all it does is lower output. But in the long run, what happens? Price gradually moves down. As price falls, what do we see? We see an increase in the supply of real balances. Why? Because the monetary, the M, stays constant. We haven't let that change. The monetary authority, central bank, whoever it is, hasn't done anything to um, accommodate this IS shock. And so what happens is that stays constant. As P goes down, M over P gets bigger. So the supply of real balances gets bigger shifting the LM curve down or to the left, right? Eventually leading back to a new long run equilibrium, which is right here. So what happened? Price fell and so we got back to long run equilibrium. So the short run effect of a negative IS shock was a reduction in output. The long run effect was no change in output. We came right back to the natural level of output, but a reduction in the price level. All right, so, and that is that is what we see. So the long run effects, change in price, short run effects, change in output. All right, that concludes chapter 11. So, some suggestions for you as far as studying this lecture. Go through and think about, well, what are all the things that could change the IS or LM curve? All the different shifting factors that we've talked about, and use that to translate into how does the aggregate demand shift, right? How does the aggregate demand curve shift as a result of those shifting factors of IS and LM? Think about it in terms of monetary policy, think about it in terms of fiscal policy, and think about it in terms of exogenous shocks. And think about it in terms of both directions. Remember to go both directions. So we did a negative IS shock, do a positive IS shock. All right. And we will continue with chapter 12 in the next lecture.